That's not anything. That's the Tommy stroke. Fine. Don't That's why I don't go swimming the same time you do. Because I don't want people to know that I know you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. And I'm Carly Bird. And we're going with our lowest spirit possible, apparently. I am. I just listened to the Mike Rowe Theo podcast, and I oh, tell you. Oh, no. Tommy's so jealous of his voice. Every now and then, people are born with a physical gift. Whether it is you're tall and you can play in the NBA. You have an arm kissed by God, and you can throw a ball at 100 miles an hour. Or you have a voice that was kissed by an angel. And you don't have to worry about what you're going to do the rest of your life. For you are given... Because Mike Rao has the voice kissed by an angel. Do you not think he has a voice? He's like, that's a voice you'd hear on TV. He has a voice you would hear on like a radio show. So yeah, he has a good voice for what he does. Hey. And she pointed out the obvious, guys, and she figured that out. Anyway. Here we are, week 59. Guys, uh, yeah, it's just amazing how far we've come. Carly, what are we listening to today? Tonight, guys, we're drinking something quite simple. We're doing tequila shots. Yep. Keeping it short, sweet, to the point. Next week, we will have a fun drink recipe that I have already. already figured that out for the turkey week. Yeah, Thanksgiving is coming up. You know what's really weird? Yeah. It's so hard because I... I look for this all the time. It's hard to find a Thanksgiving scary story. I know. <laughs> I was like, I was really like, like, I burnt the turkey. I have a, I have a ton. Like, like Carly and I joked the first year we did this, we were so worried about Christmas, about finding stories. And then when Christmas came, it was like, oh shit, this is, <laughs> this is the easiest. So hard. It's so there's easy. There's so many scary Christmas stories. And that's not a bad way. It's like, there's a lot of good Christmas stories or holiday stories. Yeah. I really last year I tried to find a Thanksgiving turkey story. There's not like a turkey came to life and killed people, whatever. There's not a lot. So but anyway, point is we're gonna have a really cool drink recipe. It's really in the festivity season. Uh but anyway, we're just gonna get right into it tonight. Carly, what's going on tonight? Well, Tom, uh tonight we're going with a theme, and our theme is dreams. Oh whether they be scary, kooky. Or just downright insane. We have some information to share with you guys. I had a dream recently the other night. And it got me thinking, oh man, I bet there's some really good stories out there that are dream related, but also spooky. Mm. So I guess to get us in the dream mood, we should talk about the dreams we've had recently. Is that going to be the scary thing in the news? Or did you want to do that right now? I think we should do it now, and then I'll tell my story, and we'll wrap it up. I love it. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're right. You're right. Like, I don't so, want to say it. So we both start. So, uh, so for you married couples out there, and for you married couples listening right now on uh, Apple Podcast, we stare at each other being like, so who's going first? And we both made this like, you go first. No, you. Fuck, who goes first? Yeah. That literally I just happened. See the fear literally crossed Literally just happened. He didn't uh, tell him to do it. Uh, so it's weird, man. I've had a lot of stress with the family lately. Um, so I had some very hallucinating dreams. Like last night. Um, I'll go first. Okay. Give it to us in as much detail and lack of gore as possible. So I'm going to give you the psychoanalysis part later. I'll just give you the straight up version Please, first. Yeah, just tell us what happened first. I, my dream was very trans. It was like, no, not that kind of trans. Like it was um transparent. Like there was a film, like a piece of glass in between us or a piece of ice. So it was murky, but enough to like make out. If that makes sense, almost like an abstract painting, but it slowly came together. Interesting. Yeah. So this past week, I had a really weird dream um, that my wife... Carly Bird, wave your hand to the audience. Say hi, Carly. Um, she was spending a lot of time with her pony, oh, no. Sir Remington. Sir Remington III. Carly Hughes. Um, and actually, while I tell the story, hold on, and this is for editing purposes, could you text me a nice picture of your pony so I could put it up on the screen for everybody? I'll text you a picture I just took of him lying down looking at a peaceful angel. But does Carly have clothes on? We don't know. 
Is that when I was born? Yeah. It's a peaceful angel. I can't. I don't know how I topped your dream. Honestly, I should have gone second. No, my dream's pretty good. It's got way more details than yours. You sleep more. <laughs> so? What does that have to do with having more detail? High rep. There's way of you high reps. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> what was I? You're talking to us about your dreams and I was spending a lot of time with a horse. Then you just stopped talking. Well, it's edit. it's not live, so I can like re-edit it anyway. That's my boy. Look at that little coddle butt. So anyway, guys, so I'm getting back to it. Um I had this dream that my wife is spending a lot of time with her, with her pony. And so what we're going to do is we're going to bring up that pony right now. This is my wife, Carly Bird, the pony. His name is Carly. Cool. His name is Remington. Do you have some facts about him? He is 13, three hands tall. He's 10 years old. In this picture, he is lying down looking like a perfect little angel pony, not like the true demon he is. Oh, he's a demon? He's very mischievous. Why is it when women say that, it means like he's an asshole that robs a bank and probably has a, like four kids, but he's like, oh, he's mischievous. Like, it's fine. It's like, this guy has probably committed a murder. And you're like, no, oh, he's fine. I can fix him. No. Nah. He just, he's always, he's, he always comes out guns a blazing. Oh, the dream's coming back to me so much more now. <laughs> Whatever. So anyway, with all this said, I pictured that she was spending more and more time with him to the point that one night she couldn't come home. She didn't come home. She's like, I have to stay the night with her and no big deal. Like, fine. So I was like chilling the whole day, no problem. And then it was like two nights, three nights, four nights, whatever. And she came back to me, but she came to me with the horse and the horse was in the truck. And that was weird because the horse was in the back of the tailgate. And then they both came to me and she was holding like his rein, whatever. And she started telling the story about the stuff. It's like, listen, um, I tell you, like we got married and we're having, you want to tell this part? No, this is your dream. I Did I not tell you this part? You did not go into this mess as much detail the but, first time. But you know the next time. part. What are we having? That you're having a hippo baby. Hippo baby. That can fly. A hippo baby that can fly. And we mm. knew this before we were born. And, it, and then you're very happy about it. All right. Is that it? And Wait. then I woke up in a cold sweat. Well, no, it wasn't a sweat. No. It was the dog licking my back. Pretty sure you woke up, you rolled over with a big old smile on your face and said, I had a dream. That why do you think that's how it works? Like as soon as it was done, I was relaying it to you. That's how it works for me. I, I, that is some type of what prejudice. What do you mean? How do I assume? That is some well, that's type how of it works for me. Prejudice where it's like, listen, this is how it works for me. Like, listen, I just go. He just rolls over and goes, I had a dream that you were pregnant with a hippo baby that could fly. I, okay, guys, I apologize for the just inequity here. She just assumes that everyone go to college because she's like, listen, I went to college. Everyone else does. <laughs> All right. Why don't you just live in a good community? I think it's my turn for my dream. Oh, yeah. That would make it awkward for you. You're like that. So anyway, basically my dream was like she was having an affair with her horse because she's always there all the time and she makes excuses for him. And that makes sense. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you give us the meaning of your dream. I don't have a meaning for my dream. Because yours is that batshit crazy. Yes. Continue. All right. So my dream starts at a friend's house, uh, a game's friend's house. And Tom and I were there in the truck. 
And there were a ton of other people there that I knew from like a long, long time ago, my childhood that I haven't seen in years and years. But it was just really strange to see everybody all at the same place with like the horse community and then like my old past life community kind of deal. And then I was like, Tommy, I have to work. You have to take me home. And Tom's like, no, I want to stick around for a while longer. And I'm like, no, you have to take me home. And for some reason in my mind, I couldn't just drive home. Like I couldn't just drive the truck home and just like leave him there and go to work. And some for some reason in my mind, I was stuck there unless Tommy drove me home. I have no idea why in my perspective, like I could not drive. So then as I'm like trying to load the truck up and like basically I'm screaming and yelling at Thomas in front of all of these people I've known for a long, long time. And it's extremely embarrassing telling him we have to go. I have to work soon. I can't be late. If I'm late, I'll get fired. You know, like all that stuff. So while I'm doing all of that, this girl walks past me who is um, in a relationship with another person that I know that I hung out with over the summer. And she was like, I can't believe you're such a horrible person. You're such a bitch, blah, 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 blah. Who's this person? I don't know her name. I just oh. know that she's Katie's girlfriend. Gotcha. So Katie's girlfriend was really mad at me. And she's like, I can't believe you let Katie hurt herself. You're an irresponsible person. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I had no idea what she's talking about. And then she's like, I'm suing you. You're, I'm, I'm suing you. So then I finally get Tommy in the truck. And on our way home, we stop at the lawyer's office. And the lawyer's like, oh, yeah, this doesn't look good. This is this is looking pretty bad for you guys. Like, she's suing you. And it's about this, this, and this. And I'm like, none of this even happened. So I'm, like, super stressed about that. And then we get in the car to make the final stretch to go home. And as Tommy and I are sitting at a red light, beside us, turning right on the turning lane, flies a witch on a broom just mm -hmm. zoom right past us zooms right past us tom goes oh, i can't believe she's driving that fast she's being so reckless and he just turns the steering wheel and starts following this witch down the road now this witch is flying so she starts to drive up and over all the cars and instead of us staying on the road like a normal vehicle would our truck takes flight and we are flying around town chasing this witch. And I'm just yelling at Thomas. I'm like, put the car on the ground. You're going to get us pulled over. We're going to get a ticket. And I was just so upset that you were not driving appropriately because you were just so mad at this witch. And that was the end of my story. Or my dream. <laughs> Why is it? Please tell me there's a dude or two like listening. That we get blamed in dreams, and this is a meme at this point, or I got blamed for it. When I was being logical in mine, or like, I just guess I gotta move out, I gotta do all this other stuff. Like, apparently, they're eh, true love, it's fine, whatever. Like, it's fine. She just waking up to have a fight. I didn't. I was like, hey, listen, I guess you found love, it's fine, it's great. Yeah, right. I mean, honestly, I'd be like, it makes sense. Whatever, you weirdo. And you're so defensive about it. It's fine. You found love in a hopeless place. You found love in a hopeless place. Anyway, with that, right. we have the stories done with today. So that was weird. That and takes I over promise we'll never do that again. Scary segment of the news. When instead, it's just scary stories in our minds. So that was a really good. There you go. There you go. Okay. That just brings us to basically. Um, the actual scary story of a dream. Hold on, I'm gonna send you something. <laughs> All right, to get us in the mood for this story, I want any of our viewers to look at the picture that I just sent Tom. Zoom in. Creepy as fuck! Right? Mm -hmm. Alright. So, here goes our story. It's called 
in the dark. Ooh. Yes. Sprinting, turning left and right, not knowing where I will end up. I don't know what is behind me, nor do I want to know. I turn back and all I see is dark. I can't see anything, but I can hear. The sound of dripping, shuffling, and my heavy breaths are the only things I can hear. Suddenly the dripping sound gets louder and the shuffling turns into heavy footsteps. Out of nowhere, the footsteps suddenly stop and I stop running. My chest is heaving and my legs are burning. In my lonely silence, I notice the dripping is closer and then the dripping stops. There's an eerie silence that sends shivers up my spine. I can't see anything because it's so dark. I start to wonder, not knowing if I'm going to run into a wall or something. After walking around aimlessly for what feels like hours, I see a dim orange light posted by an old wooden brown door. In relief, I head over to the dimly lit door. As I get closer to the door, I feel comforting warmness from the light. The feeling makes me relax my tense shoulders. Just as I'm about to reach the door, I feel something warm drip onto my upward pointed nose and rolling off to the left side of my face. Another drip, drip, drip. The drips are dropping more frequently. I bring my left hand up to my face to wipe off the thick liquid. After removing my hand from my face, I look at it only to see it completely covered in warm red blood. Slowly I lift my head. Hands are shaking and breathing ragged. I come face to face with a pitch black figure. Mm. It's teeth out like a snarl as its body hangs from the ceiling. All I can see is its eyes and razor sharp teeth, which are stained with blood. My eyes go wide with absolute terror. My mouth opens to scream as the thing lunges at me, ready for its long awaited meal. My eyes are wide open as I quickly sit up from my sleeping position. I look up at my ceiling. My body is shaking with fear and my breathing is erratic. I run my hand down my face to see if there's any blood on my face. To my relief, there is no blood on my face and nothing on the ceiling. Sweat trickles down the side of my face like a waterfall as I remember my dream vividly. I run a hand down my face absentmindedly again, almost as if I'm trying to wipe away my fears. I get out of my bed and open the curtains, letting the blinding sunshine into my room. After opening my curtains, I walk over to my door to open it. As I grasp the doorknob, I realize the door's locked. After scrounging around for a key, unfortunately, I couldn't find one. I resorted to forcibly open the door, kicking and harshly twisting the handle in hopes of breaking the lock. After a few minutes, I take a breath. I'm out of breath and still in a sleepy haze. As I'm resting on my bed, almost asleep, I hear the familiar sound of a door unlocking. I bolt up thinking that my mom heard all of my noise. As my feet land on my plush carpet, the doorknob turns. All of a sudden, the doorknob turns left and right violently, stopping me in my tracks. Only a couple of seconds later does it stop. Thinking that my mind is playing tricks on me because I'm still half asleep, I walk over to the door and twist the doorknob. Fortunately, the door opens with a blast of icy cold air, effectively waking me up. Only when I'm a few steps away from the room and fully awake do I realize that my door never had a lock on it before. Completely suspicious, I go to my brother's room to see if he was pulling a prank on me. I open his bedroom door only to see him fast asleep. There are no signs of him moving the covers. His breathing is even and light, and his slippers are in the same place as he left them last night when I put him to bed. I look around his room silently before my eyes land on his open closet door. It wasn't open last night, and Mason is afraid of his closet, so he wouldn't open it at night. I walk over to the open closet, carefully avoiding his toys. I open the closet door and wince as the hinges groan of old age. Mm. I look back to the little boy in the blue race car bed to see if I've woken him up, which thankfully I didn't. As I return my attention to the closet, I see a dirty footprint on the carpet. The footprint is too big to be Mason's or mine. 
but too small to be mom or dad's. Moving the clothing that were in the way of my clear view of the closet, I noticed that there were more dirty footprints. After following the footprints the short way they led, I come face to face with a wall filled with scratch marks and tally marks. Dirty and bloody handprints are scattered around. Some are smeared downwards, upwards, or sideways. A small, frail voice scares me out of my trance. Are you finally meeting Big Sister Anna? What? I recognize the small, tired voice as my little brother Mesa. I turn around and pick him up, making sure he's facing away from the closet. Mason puts his hands on my shoulders and pushes himself up to see his closet clearly. Taking this chance, I shakily ask Mason, Who is Big Sister Anna? He looks at me with a closed-eyed smile. She's Big Sister Anna, he replies cheerfully. That was not a good response. <laughs> Did you know that she always wanted to meet you? But she can only see you when you're sleeping at night. She told me yesterday that she was going to see if you were awake last night. My eyes widen in horror. The thought of someone watching me in my sleep, hoping that I'm awake, even though I'm positive he's making it up, it's still a very terrifying thought. Okay, I said shakily. How about we go downstairs and see what mom's making for breakfast? Mason nods rapidly and wiggles out of my arms. Once he's free, he runs out of the room and to the main stairway. Going back to the closet, I quickly snap a picture of the wall with my forgotten phone that was in my pajama pocket. Rushing out of Mason's room, I look at the picture more closely. There isn't anything different on the wall except for a particular hole that was rather large. Stopping in the middle of the dark hallway, I zoom in on one of on the hole in the picture. My eyes widen. Hands are trembling as I look. In the hole, there's an eye looking out, staring right at the camera. The iris is completely black, making the pupil blend in. I wouldn't nope. have known it if it was an eye if it wasn't for the white parts around the pupil. As predicted in the weather forecast, there are going to be severe thunderstorms. I recognize the deep rumble of thunder, the unmistakable pitter-patter of rain on the windows. Mm -hmm. After a particular rumble of thunder, the lights flickered. Out of the corner of my eyes, I could see a black figure that was easily over seven feet tall walk to my room, making the same shuffling sound in my recent nightmare. The figure turned around, staring into my frightened blue orbs. It was staring at me in the shadow of my door, but I could see it clearly. The figure smiled at me, showing its blood-stained teeth. My eyes widened in recognition. I opened my mouth to scream, but the figure puts a pitch-black finger up to its mouth, signaling me to be quiet. I was too terrified to do anything else except to listen to the giant. The figure tilts its head in an almost innocent way before smiling maliciously at me and waved. It's so exciting to finally meet you, Jesse. I'm Anna, but you can call me Big Sister Anna, said the seven-foot-tall creature in an oddly feminine voice. Turning away from me, nope. Big Sister Run. Anna walked into my room, hiding in the shadows. I slowly turn around before breaking into a sprint. My eyes filled with tears of fright as I bolt down the stairs into the kitchen. I run right into my dad. My breathing ragged and fresh, salty tears run down my face as I explain the terrifying events. My parents only look at me in amusement, thinking I'm making all of this up. Oh, don't worry, honey. I'm sure this big sister, Anna, will leave your room soon, my mother said with a giggle and a joking tone. My dad laughs along with her. I look over at Mason, only to see him smiling at me. While you're waiting, why don't you set the table and eat your breakfast? We have a big day ahead of us says my dad with a smirk of amusement on his face. I can only nod my head, and still shaking in fear as I set the table, and all throughout the day I avoid going back into my room. It's now nighttime, and I'm dreading the fact that it's time for me to go to sleep. I know I can't sleep anywhere, but my room, or else I'll get in trouble. I slowly go up to my room and shakily open the door. 
I quickly turn on my light, and I don't see anything out of the ordinary. I sigh in relief as I look all through my room, and I don't see Big Sister Anna. Still cautious, I turn off all my lights and hop into bed, pulling my blankets over my head as if they were some sort of protection. I quickly fall into a deep sleep. This is it, I think, as I stare in horror at the figure on my ceiling. I had the same dream as last night. I woke up sweating and shaking, but I heard something moving, and I look up at my ceiling and I see a dark figure, Big Sister Anna. My eyes are wide open, my mouth open to scream as she lunges at me with her razor-sharp teeth. Her blood-stained teeth is the last thing I see before my whole world goes dark. And that was the tale of In the Dark. She's seven feet tall. I know. I don't know. Like, I, I don't know why that stuck out with me. Like, bitch is tall. And I'm like, why are you friends with that? You mean Mason? Why was her brother Mason? Friends yes. With her? How, old because was, it probably, how old was Mason? Did I miss that? I think he was only like four. Yeah, that makes sense. It was like a baby. I don't know why I thought he was like 13. No! <laughs> <laughs> she put him to bed. We all know. Anyway. Damn, that's a good story. That's imaginary friends. Yeah. Baba Duke. Well, I thought that maybe Big Sister Anna showed herself differently to Mason than she did to Jesse. You know what that reminds me of so much, guys? The Baba Duke story, by the way. Yeah. That was a good movie. I could watch that again. And just like about like ba, ba, and then it comes out and finally kills people. But the point was like it was so scary. I could the dog died. Spoilers. That was really sad. That was horrible. Mother broke her neck. Just just held it. Just Tommy. twisted it like a bottle cap. No. This one. Stop it. Nobody wants to talk about that. And the fact that they were okay with it then. That was like messed up. I was like, wait, you fucking killed the dog. No one cares about that. People want to know about that. It's fine. Anyway. Carly, that was a really good story. Thank you. To really round out the whole weird hippo baby Remington and and chasing I can, a, I can fly a car, chasing chasing a witch down the street. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But so now it is time for scary stuff in the news. Oh, Ooh-hoo. we are doing this. Yes, we are because I had this one, and this one is really good because it has a video too, and here it is. Because this is why people actually, I think, watch the show now. I know. This Whoa, is, what is that? Florida man who survived an alligator attack caught, caught on, on a drone. drone I shouldn't be alive. Stop. And it. I have it. Stop it. This is amazing. <gasps> look at his face. Is that from the alligator? Or did he look like that before the alligator? I'm going to mute this real quick. Watch this right now. So right now, what you're seeing right now on the screen, and I will move it across here. So this dude, we're going to call him Ted. Oh, I was going to call him Billy Bob. This is Ted right here. He's swimming off this dock. Okay. This right here is the alligator, alligator. coming straight towards him. Oh, Lordy. This was on Instagram and TikTok, by the way. <gasps> they collide. Oh. And then, as you can tell with the ruffle, he somehow beats the alligator off and he's able to swim towards shore. But there is damage. I got his face. Mm-hmm. It broke his jaw and it dented his skull. Yeah. How did he live? That's crazy. Company. When he came face to face with the gator, Laverde's head clamped between the reptile's jaws, the animal's sheer force crushing part of his skull and breaking his jaw. It was just one large bite. I heard my jaw snap, and then I just continued swimming. But just just continued swimming. Oh my gosh! So that's horrible. What's amazing about this was the comment section on Instagram, which that was taken down, which was so amazing, which was like, he was a wuss, blah, blah, blah. We, back when I was in the Boy Scouts, we did this all the time. There were gators around all the time. No problem. It's a once in a lifetime thing. Basically Floridian saying like, it's fine. This is normal. It is not fine to share the water with dinosaurs that can eat you. Right. And be like, it's fine. What happened to Timmy? He got eaten. It's fine. It happens every now and then. Right. It's completely fine. 
Like no one was in that oh, comment section. Oh, he crushed section, his skull. No one in that comment section was like, do we have too many gators? Whatever. I did like the other things. Like, why would I swim in stuff that was like diarrhea? That one was actually kind of funny. Yeah, that's true. Um, like, why is he swimming in that murky ass continue. water? Just when the gator momentarily released his grip, La Verde was able to escape. Here, you could see him swimming away before making it to land and calling for help. Emergency rescue teams rushing him to a nearby hospital where he underwent a six-hour surgery Oof. to repair the damage to his skull and jaw. La Verde spent a total of 10 days in the hospital. He had part of his skull removed to decrease swelling, and doctors had to take out a portion of his right temporal lobe. He's now been released and is recovering. The firefighter is all... Had to take out part of his brain? Mm -hmm. No, part of his skull. Oh. Because of, because of swelling. Well, I heard them say the skull, but then they said the temporal lobe. Yeah. I thought that might be part of a brain. No, temporal lobe is right here, the eye. Oh, lobe. wow. Lobe is eye. Wow, that's because... nuts. So, let's get to this bad boy article then. We're just going to get into it a little bit more here. Why is it so scary? Is that there are dinosaurs that still live in the uh -oh. United States, in something Virginia? Something went wrong. What I hit? It said something went wrong. And sure, you are connected to the internet. Oh, we're still good. Thirty-one thirty. Internet's fine. Then why did it do that? I don't know. It's computers either your old. That might be what it is. He's... Drone video shot from overhead captured La Verdant Bruche. I realize this is not actually doing that. Okay. Sorry, people. <laughs> Because if we all know, when Tommy reads, you should probably follow along. Yeah. For some details on what's going on. I would uh, love some details. Uh, so anyway. Wait. There we go. So can you see it okay, Carly? Yeah. Okay. Drone video shot from overhead captured La Verdis Bush with death. Brush with death. As soon as he... Re <laughs> <laughs> this is why... This is why we it. As soon as he realized he was inside the gator's mouth, he said he tried to open its jaws when I felt the teeth. I immediately knew, La Verde said. And then as I opened it, I knew that either that I either turned it or it would turn me. Whoa, that but it sounds was like a villain story. But it was confused, just as I was confused. And then it just let go, like an awkward meeting at the DMV. I added that part. He uh -huh. swam to the dock, hoisted himself up, and was driven to the hospital by a good Samaritan. He even called 911 himself to explain what happened. I am not going to put extra stress on somebody that is already driving. I feel like that's your mother. Like for some reason, she gets bit by a shark. Oh, guys, I it's just fine. don't want to put extra stress on somebody that's already oh, driving a bloody man somewhere. Oh, my Lance. It's just my arm that's gone. It's not that big of a deal. Oh, my gosh. We love you, but you'd be like that. Like, oh, man, it's fine. It's fine. Like, you are hemorrhaging blood. It's fine. Wow. <laughs> La Verde underwent an emergency six hour. This is the part that I love about this story so much. How is it you can walk up to a good Samaritan? And I'm picturing his eyes popped out of his head, right. his head shrunken. Right. And he's like, excuse me, sir. Right. Could he can't you even help talk me? because his jaw's broken. He's fine to do that. But then you're like, by the way, he went through like six 30 hours. hours. Yeah, yeah right. six hours of surgery. Right. Like, that doesn't make up. You can walk to, to somebody. To put his face back together. That makes no sense. If people want to see this any other way than a legitimate miracle, it's silly of you. Literary said, I shouldn't be alive. Sitting alongside his wife, he shared the message. Find your find your God. I like that. <laughs> find your God. Find him. It's silly. I get that. I get that scary. I do. A little, a little. I get that scary. I do. But life is scary place. So you can carry that load by yourself or have someone carry it for you. And, and that is. The scary news of the day. I just, again, and the fact is. Also a triathlete. 
and a former U.S. Air Force pararescuer. This story is about a miracle and also the call to action. After a brush with death, he's now challenging others to cherish every day. Find the joy, however that looks like to you. That's my challenge to you. Find it. Wildlife expert Ron McGill says La Verde is very fortunate. There have been other instances where people have not survived, but they were not eaten. They were not mauled. They ended up being drowned. 16 gator attacks have been reported in Florida so far this year. Alligators are opportunistic feeders. They will bite at whatever they can bite as quickly as they can. When something falls in the water, splashes next to them, they bite at the splash. La Verde is expected to have more surgeries. But for now, he's focused on the future. I know the importance of moving forward. So with that, maybe this will inspire some of you. His journey to recovery will be long, but it's one he's grateful to be making. Julie Serkin, NBC News. Gee, so Pete. That's the same. Why? Can we get... I'm going to flip the screens out here. This is, this is grinds my ears. We might be here a while. You no, get, you no. Get, this t- is the last. This is the last comment, and then we're wrapping it up. I know, I know, I know. Why is it all the wildlife people are like abused housewives? What do you mean by that? Literally, just listen to that person. Like, oh, with like a little bird falls in the water, it's gonna come over and just just give it a nibble. Be like, oh, are you something to eat? Not like we have drone footage and we are staring at it right now and being like, no, this motherfucker, I'm gonna eat his ass. It's like you ain't a bird. I see him doing a. Frog stroke? What stroke is that, by the way? What's this? That's not anything. That's the Tommy stroke. Fine. Do That's it. why I don't go swimming the same time you do. Because I don't want people to know that I know you. See you guys next time on Spirits and Ghost Stories. Bye. Bye.